This is Michael Cowan, and welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation. He helps us pan for the gold inside ourselves. You need to have grit. I mean, a lot of this is grit. I feel like I've been made a better lawyer. They're talking about something that's real to them. You have to be really careful not to be Goliath. They saved a bunch of lives and changed society forever. But let's just begin the conversation. Welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation, your source for guidance to win bigger verdicts, get more cases, and manage your practice. And now, here's your host, noteworthy author, sought-after speaker, and renowned trial lawyer, Michael Cowan. Today on Trial Lawyer Nation, I'm really excited to have Lisa Blue with us. Lisa is a legendary attorney. Uh, She's out of Dallas, Texas, but she's done cases all across the country. She has over $350 million in jury verdicts, hundreds of millions of dollars more in in, uh, settlements, she won the largest mesothelioma verdict in the state of Texas, over $55 million. She was part of the team uh, in Texas that tried a Biox case with a $253 million verdict. Uh, she's also the leading expert in the country on jury selection. She's written at least three books on jury selection. Uh, she is brought in on mega cases all over the country to help with the jury selection. And she's got a very unique background on that because she has two master's degrees in psychology, a PhD in counseling psychology, and was involved as a psychologist before she got her uh, law law degree. So we have a lot to learn from her. I'm excited to have her here, and I'd like to welcome Lisa Blue. Today on Trial Lawyer Nation, we have Lisa Blue. Lisa, how are you doing today? I'm wonderful. Thank you for the opportunity talk to you and hopefully lawyers all over the United States. Well, thank you. You've actually been probably more influential in my career than you know. I met you back in 1998 at the Trial Lawyers College. Uh, You were there for a week and then you had to leave and you got like a, what was a $34 million verdict or something, so I guess you didn't really need the other two weeks. It was a um, very difficult uh, nuclear radiation it was probably one of the last cases I tried with my husband. Wow. But uh, I hated to leave. I was there a little longer, but... I think about 10 days. I'm trying to remember. That's very good. But uh, you you think you quickly proved that you were fine as a trial lawyer without the other uh, couple weeks. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, all the things, you know, you've so much we could talk about. You've got all these big verdicts. You've built up uh, with your late husband a huge firm. Uh, you've been president of AHA. You're running for state bar president. You're the probably national authority on jury selection, having written multiple books. But I want to kind of start from the beginning. How did you get interested in law and lawyers? Well, as a psychologist, um, I got a great opportunity in Houston to work at the medical center. And I was in private practice, but when I was in private practice, I got an opportunity to work at a psychiatric hospital in Deer Park, if you know anything about Houston. And it turned out that during the 80s, I don't know that a lot of lawyers think about this, but some of the greatest trial lawyers in America were in Houston. Joe Jamail, Howard Nations, uh, John O'Quinn, Racehorse Haynes. They were very uh, famous top names in Houston that you didn't have in Dallas during the 80s. And what was so interesting to me looking back now is in the 80s in Houston, that's where the really good jurors were that the top lawyers could get big verdicts. Yeah. And so how did that draw you to start getting involved? Or how did you start getting involved in law? Because you were a PhD psychologist. I was first. And so, and still uh, are, I guess. I am. I still see judges and lawyers only. I have a small private practice in psychology to keep up my license as a PhD psychologist. But back in Houston, because there were so many great uh, trial lawyers, it turned out that my patients uh, were usually kids that had drug problems, and I'd say a very high percentage of those kids had parents that were trial lawyers. Huh. And so one day, um, one of my friends, Howard Nations, um, who I just knew down there, asked me if I wanted to go with him to pick a jury. And I remember uh, that was probably my first case in a courtroom as a psychologist because the opponent 
said, does anybody here know Dr. Lisa Blue? She's here to psychoanalyze you. <laughs> and I wanted to just shrink under the desk. I was so embarrassed and so ashamed and uh, scared that I had hurt Howard Nation's case. And what did you learn from that first experience watching a jury selection? How much I loved it. Uh, I grew. I don't think I, I can say back in the 80s that I had this passion for lawyers. But um, as a psychologist, uh, I, when I think about this, and I, when people ask me, how do you want me to introduce you, Lisa, my passion is lawyers and judges. And if somebody said, here's Lisa Blue, she loves lawyers and uh, judges, that would be a really good introduction. Oh, wow. And so from there, where did you, what was your next step? Well, I'm so blessed. I knew somebody at the DA's office. Uh, I worked under Henry Wade. I don't know if people know this, but that's Roe versus Wade. Oh, wow. And uh, before he died, I got to have lunch with him, and I asked Henry Wade of Roe versus Wade, were you uh, anti-choice? And he said, no, Lisa, I was not. I was on that case because I was the first name. And, of course, as the DA of Dallas, I had a duty to enforce the law. So I guess you decided to go to law school, then you went to work for the, the DA's, DA's office and tried, what, 125 cases or something? I did. I um, started misdemeanors, and probably the best uh, advice, and I hope people listening to this will tell their kids, or if you're a young lawyer, you'll think about this, and that's always get a specialty. Always be really good at something, because if you're a generalist, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to shine or to be able to have something that you can say, hey, I'm, I'm good at this. So that's what got me started at the DA. Um, my specialty was child abuse cases, which I love doing. As a psychologist, I got to be a psychologist and a trial lawyer with kids. And I ended my career in organized crime, which was a wonderful way to end the six or seven years I had at the DA's office. I imagine the psychology would really come in handy when you're having to talk to the victims because, uh, you know, it's so hard to go in. You've been victimized. You have to talk to some stranger. Um, I imagine they were really blessed to have you there. Well, thank you. It's all about making people feel comfortable as a psychologist and talking to the lawyers listening to this podcast. The one thing that is in common with being a trial lawyer and a psychologist is when you stand up to do jury selection, it's exactly like doing therapy. Really? And I say that because <clears throat> the way I start <clears throat> my jury selection is exactly how I start my therapy sessions, which are uh, my general introduction is there are no rules. Uh, you're safe to say anything that you want. There's no way you can get in trouble. There's no way you can say anything wrong or dumb or that's not appropriate. Uh, you are in a safe environment to say anything that you feel. And that's what you want people to do in jury selection. So it's really the, the same, therapy and, and voir dire, which I, I love so much because I get to talk directly to people. And is that your specialty, or what would you say your specialty is now? I mean, it's been a little while since you left the DA's office. My specialty is lawyers. Okay. Um, well, my specialty is I love jury selection. I've written four books on jury selection. Uh, I've written a book on communication with my brother, who's a Ph.D. psychologist in Atlanta, and I'm working hopefully on my last book, which is going to uh, center around creativity and thinking outside of the box and um, it's going to be a lot about people like Mark Lanier and Zoe Littlepage and Deborah Chang and people that I think are so creative as lawyers. So other than buying your books, could you have some tips for us on jury selection? Well yes, especially in today's time. You asked me about my passion. Uh, as a psychologist, here's passion number one, I love to teach mindfulness to lawyers and judges, and I'm so blessed because three days ago I just taught a mindfulness uh, course to the Eastern District, and I've taught this uh, another course 
um, to some Houston judges on how to improve the jury the system. And the way I put that speech together was I contacted who I think are the best 10 jury psychologists in America. And I said, give me your top five tips for improving the jury system. And so I put together a speech. It's called 21 Steps to Improve the, the Jury System. And it's really for judges. Mindfulness is for lawyers and judges. And then a speech I'm giving tomorrow in Houston is picking a jury in post-Trump times. Tell me about I'm that. I'm fascinated <laughs> with Donald Trump. Um, I'm fascinated with Donald Trump, um, not so much because of what he's doing as president, but the fact that the people that voted for President Trump are, are very loyal to him. And one of my, I feel like my duties as a trial psychologist and a trial lawyer is to really understand people that like Trump, people that voted for Trump, what makes them different on a jury, whether they're anywhere in the United States? And uh, I think it's language. One of my favorites that I hope people on the, listening to this podcast will go out and buy a book called um, Words Matter by Frank Luntz, who's a wonderful pollster um, who actually recently did a focus group on Donald Trump voters. And what he showed us as trial lawyers is there's a certain type of language about freedoms and independence and doing what they think is right, being passionate about family values. So it's really learning what is important to people because as every trial lawyer should know, it's all who is in your audience. It's not about the trial lawyer. Absolutely, and I, I you, you learned that from Spence. I know that because we were at the camp together. And experience, because I've had times when I've felt like I was clearly the better lawyer, but did not win the case. Uh, and other times when maybe I wasn't the better lawyer, but I did win the case. Uh, the the facts, the clients, the jury, everything else matters. Uh, Boy, it's to me, it's all in the jury. And part of the mindfulness that I've been working on, actually, since I got up at seven in the morning to listen to you speak on mindfulness in an AJ conference, has been separating my self-worth and happiness as an individual with the amount of money I get from a case uh, because I um, obviously want to get as much money as I can for my clients but I cannot base my happiness on things that are external right I know as a psychologist the lawyers that work for the money that base their self-esteem on how much they make what they have how big their house is they usually aren't the ones that are the happiest Absolutely. It's the lawyers who tell you, I would do this for free, and they really don't have a retirement age set. Um, those are the really successful lawyers. Yeah, I don't think I do as many cases as I'm handling right now for free, but I can't see not doing it. Right. It's, I, I like it too much, and I'm not good at anything else. It's what I'm good at. I mean, I was a decent waiter, but other than that, this, is, this seems to be what I'm supposed to do. Uh, and I'm going to go back to jury selection, Trump, and I'm sorry I'm going to these things, but I, I talk and you say things and things occur to me. Do you think all trial lawyers should be at least in some kind of therapy? I think everybody should be in therapy. I uh, love to take my three girls. I'm a widow. Uh, I recently turned 65, so I'm trying to raise three kids with a full-time practice and run for state bar president. Um, and it's wonderful to have somebody to talk to. And as trial lawyers, our um, goal should be to grow. And the thing I love about trial lawyers is if you want to be a great trial lawyer, you have to do things that make you uncomfortable. You have to think out of the box. You have to learn not to care what other people think about you. And uh, that's part of the, the growth that we all have to, to go through. And as a matter of fact, you didn't ask, but um, I have all kind of learning disabilities. I'm dyslexic, I have some ADD, I have insomnia, I get up every morning between 3.30 and 4, I'm, I'm out the door exercising before my kids get up. And so every morning I'm listening to books on tape 
Um, and I'm, I'm trying to improve myself. I'm trying to um, listen to, to books on tape about communication. I want to talk about some of my favorites uh, because if I were a trial lawyer listening to this podcast, the books that I recommend that I think every trial lawyer should read, number one is the uh, Checklist Manifesto because it will help hopefully make sure you don't make a mistake in the future. The Storyteller Secret, uh, I loved. It was meant for trial lawyers. And a book that I just finished called When by Daniel Pink, which talks about how everything in life is timing. If you as a trial lawyer can figure out when are you tired? When are you most productive? And yes, we know if we're owls or we're larks. Are we night owls? Do we love to get up in the morning? But it's more than that. It's really a book on productivity. And just a little quick story in the book. It talks about a study in Israel where eight judges um, looked at over a thousand parole cases. And what they found is in the morning, um, people had a 40% chance of getting parole, but after lunch, when they were tired and they were hungry, the chances of parole went to zero. Wow. And so it really proved to me timing is everything. But those are, are three books that people might want to get started with, other than, of course, David Ball's book on damages and reptile. And at a minimum, at least Lisa Blue's Little Blue Book on jury selection, oh. both volumes. <laughs> Thank you. Which I do uh, read when I'm getting ready for jury selection. You have a lot of really good practical tips. I reread lots of things before jury, before each trial. Just to it's great because as a psychologist, you can't hear the good stuff enough. Because we think we know something, but we really don't. But another thing that I think about all day, every day, is what makes a great trial lawyer and what makes a great trial judge. And one way that... Uh, I've learned what makes a great trial judge is not me. I go to trial judges that have been on the bench for more than 40 years that are popular, and I always ask them, what do you think makes a great trial judge? And one of the Dallas judges, I'll tell you three, one of the Dallas judges, Ken Mulberg, said, what makes a great trial judge is that I never forgot how hard it was to be a trial lawyer. The second thing I heard is what makes a great trial judge, never do anything just because you can. And the third tip that I heard, probably most important, and I say it all the time because it's true, no matter if you're a trial judge or trial lawyer, people don't remember how you rule or what you do as a judge. People remember how you treated them. That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true, because I can think of one or two judges that are maybe on my naughty list, and it's not really the rulings, it's the the yelling, the unreasonable requirements, right. the mean tone of voice with clients and lawyers, uh, even if the rulings ended up being okay. Whereas I've had other judges that just killed my case, but they're at least nice about it, and right. it wasn't as painful. <laughs> and as long as I felt that it was based on their good faith, interpretation of the law and facts and not on some political or personal relationship. But I promise you, Michael, in 20 or 30 years, you'll remember what ha what happened in a courtroom based on how somebody treated you. And you probably won't remember the ruling. Yeah. I remember my $150 sanction for raising my voice when objecting because the other side was repeatedly violating a motion limiting. Now, she sanctioned the other side in front of the jury and waited until I left, but said that I was not allowed to be upset about it, only she could be upset about it. And uh, I mean, the $50 was not the big thing. It was just right. the, well, I was so mad I walked home from the courthouse instead of driving because I, <laughs> I had to get it out of my system. So we talked about the uh, you know, post-Trump and, and Trump jurors, who I, I don't think are necessarily bad jurors for us any more than I think that necessarily liberal Democrats are always good jurors for us. True. Um, what are some other things you think we should be looking at and trying to get better at jury selection? Because I, mean, I remember watching you pick a jury in the 90s in Cameron County, and we'd have to go move jury selection into the central jury room because there weren't enough jurors to put in the courtroom because you'd get too many people off for cause, and they'd have to have mistrials. So we had to get 
130 person panels instead of a 40 person panel like everybody else so you know I want to hear what you have to say well I think jury selection can be boiled down to two words belief system in my heart of hearts I I'm a I've been a trial lawyer for 38 years and I believe that people do not judge cases on evidence they judge cases based on their belief system. They, everybody has on a filter, you, like fake glasses, and they see the evidence through their filter. And the sad thing about federal courts that don't let lawyers pick their juries, their own, have attorney voir dire, is that they don't understand federal judges that the case, I believe, is over once the jury is selected because of their bias and prejudices. Not that they'll say their bias and prejudice, but right. we all have leanings. We, and we all see um, the evidence through our own filters. And I definitely felt that way. I went through jury selection in federal court uh, about 10 years ago. And I had something I needed to say because uh, I had a leaning uh, about, an, about an issue in the case, and honestly, the prosecutor was someone I went to high school with, and she was my banker's daughter, um, and I would not have been a good juror for her on that case, and she probably assumed I would have been by demographics and the fact that I went to high school with her and her dad was my banker, uh, but I, and I did speak up. It was, it, it was difficult. I mean, it, there was this incredible social pressure to sit there and be quiet, and of course we can follow the law judge, and she's sitting way up there, and we're sitting down, and um, and you know, how do we avoid when we're talking to jury? How do we avoid that attitude and getting them to speak? Exactly the same way you do therapy. You and I both know, uh, and I love your training because you've had Spence training, you've had uh, trial lawyer college, and a psych degree. And you have a psych degree too. Okay, <laughs> but only a bachelor's. It's not not doesn't compare, but it's no something. It does it absolutely does? And therapy. <laughs> We all should. It um, helps. It's all about making people feel comfortable. And as you know, show me yours, I'll show you mine. Um, and it's being able, and this I, I learned the hard way, and if, if I could say something to the trial lawyers, jury selection is so hard because when you do it right, and I'm going to say right, you should be able to have jurors say, like they've said to me, Miss Blue, I don't like you. Miss Blue, they've said this to me in Fort Worth, I think you're sleazy. Um, Miss Blue, I think uh, that what you just said was phony. Wow. And that's good, but it doesn't feel good, but it is good because the test is to the trial lawyers that I want to say to the audience, can you make that audience feel so comfortable that they can stand up and say, Michael, I don't like you. I think you're a sleaze king. Now that, to me, is a good voir dire. For the, I'll say for men and, and females, if at the end of voir dire you haven't sweated through your suits <laughs> or your dresses, you're not doing it right. It's hard because you want people to say... I, I hate lawyers, I hate lawsuits, I hate big verdicts, because you have a choice as a trial lawyer. You can find out before they're selected or after they give you a verdict. So what's your advice? So this is one thing I've struggled with. Is, um, I get, I'm good at getting people to talk about how they hate my case and they hate plaintiff's verdicts and they hate, you know, but they can be fair. Um, are they admit to me they have a bias but then we have a judge who'll say well can you follow the law you know and then the judge keeps them on you only have so many peremptories and my only thing i worry about is you get this huge conversation that we spend you know unfortunately sometimes only 20 or 30 minutes that's all they'll give you uh talking about and how do you turn around to like this is case is not like that i, I hate starting the trial with an atmosphere of okay we're here in a bs case uh we shouldn't give any money. Nobody in the right mind would give any money. Now let's start opening statement. You mean you've set the stages? It feels like it's negative. It feels like a real negative cloud. Cloud, right? And what you need to get out, but how do you 
then transition either sometime at the end of or dire or in your opening from the negativity to now we have the exception this is the case that's not frivolous this is the well i think it's how you frame it and as trial lawyers it's a great concept to understand framing in my belief, I've always believed that jurors will forgive anything as long as you tell them the truth. And if you start the voir dire, just like, and you did this at the Trial Lawyers College, members of the jury panel, I feel like I'm starting negative. But the reason I'm setting up my questions of who cannot, who cannot give money, who cannot sit on a personal injury case is because that's how we decide if you are the right juror or not. So it's all about what, what you tell the jury. But um, I think a great voir dire is getting people to be honest enough so they, you talk about the warts on your case everybody hears what the warts are and then the people say oh I can handle that wart or no I I think that's terrible I would be prejudiced but to go back because I want to be very thoughtful about our audience that this is trial lawyers all over the United States and when you talked about um, being a feeling a negative cloud first of all you've got to know the law you've got to know things like Hyundai versus Cortez and you were talking about sometimes it, the judge will rehabilitate or the opponent will say, yes, but can't you be fair? And first of all, you got to know the law in Vordire. When I go to trial, I take a big paper notebook of all the most important Vordire cases, and I try to get people on the panel to repeat phrases in the cases. But my co-author and one of my best friends, Robert Hirshhorn, who I adore, who I hire uh, to pick my juries, um, he, uh, you know, we, we always start with, you got to start strong and end strong. And then what uh, Robert Hirshhorn ta taught me is you have to put them in the, he calls it the Cortez coffin. Which, for example, somebody might say they have a bias against personal injury lawsuits. Now, here's where trial lawyers make a mistake. They move on to the next question. And because of the Cortez case, you have to, as a trial lawyer, do something different. You have to nail the coffin. And you have to say to the jury panel, I'm sorry if I'm being repetitive, but because of the law, I need to ask you, Mr. Smith, Miss Jones, no matter who asks you, if you can be fair, are you going to give the same answer and nod your head? Yes. And no matter how many times somebody asks you, but can't you be fair? Are you willing to stick with the answer you just gave me, which is, I can't be fair because I don't like personal injury lawsuits. So my, um, my tip on that on getting people to say they can't be fair is baby steps. It doesn't work to say, oh, can't be fair, raise your hand, hey, judge, I got him off. No, that will not work. Yeah, well, the other issue is everyone thinks they're being fair. They just think fairness does not include giving people money for a personal injury. Uh, that's, And so it's how you word it. And I have seen that when you right. do get it, get them committed and when you legitimately listen to them, they didn't feel like you were manipulating them into an answer that you wanted, some people get agitated when the other side tries to get them to say, well, you don't really feel that strongly. Right. But then I've just seen some judges, it's a mix, that they don't care what case law you have. If, if the person, unless the person will say, I will not follow the law and the instructions you give me, they'll put them on the panel. Right. Uh, where it should be, they're supposed to look at the gestalt of the whole thing and does this person appear to have a bias? And it shouldn't be a magic word on one side or the other. Uh, but, you know, different judges look at it different ways and some unfortunately give us 15 minutes and right. there's a limit to what you can do other than find just the people most likely to admit their bias which sometimes I fear are just the people that figured out the game and don't want to serve okay well <laughs> let's go there people that just don't want to serve I don't think people that don't want to serve should be forced to serve and my rationale as a psychologist is if I wanted to go on a date with you and you didn't want to go on a date with me and I forced you to go on a date and then I said, oh, by the way, the date's going to last four weeks, <laughs> you'd be awfully unhappy. Yeah. So 
you don't want people to to do that but you know I talked about knowing the law Michael how important that is but you also you have to know the judge if the judge says and people ask me this Lisa what do I do when I have 15 minutes you prioritize 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 and you start your voir dire of course you start with the Robert Hirschhorn this is a big and important case but it's a simple case you start strong you end strong and you say I have 15 minutes and so I have to go fast and here's the goal do you in your heart of hearts are you going to start this case with a leaning that's a bias or prejudice speak now or forever hold your peace because this is a three-week trial and if you get on the wrong case it's a problem for everyone perfect that's why I like talking to you <laughs> Now, you've been very politically active, and uh, what are your feelings as to whether trial lawyers have a responsibility to be politically active? Well, my sweet husband, Fred Barron, uh, who's now deceased, he used to get up in the morning and he used to say to me, you know, Lisa, politics matter. Think about it. Um, everything from Rosa Parks to civil rights to the Me Too movement, everything now is politics and legislation. And I always tell lawyers when I stand in front of a crowd, look, no one cares about you, but you. The Chamber of Commerce is not going to run to the courthouse to help the trial lawyers. They want more power. And if you don't stand together and help politicians that care about the civil justice system, that care about keeping the courthouse doors open, they will not stay open. My biggest fear is the end of civil uh, jury trials and the beginning of forced arbitration. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm so proud. I'm going to give a shout out to the American Association for Justice. If you are not a member, shame on you, you must join because I know having been president, um, that staff, that team, including Linda Lipson, your CEO, gets up every morning to do everything she can to keep the courthouse doors open. And she can't do it un unless all of us help. And they've really done some incredible things. I mean, just the, recently, I mean, in, the, in a not friendly environment for trial lawyers, there's a case, Auburn, as a U.S. Supreme Court case, on when Medicaid can get back their full lien and when they have to reduce it because there's not enough money to compensate fully for every element of damages. And Congress had actually passed a law getting rid of Auburn where Medicaid was going to get first money, and then they fixed it and they took that out of the law. And to do that in this environment, I mean, they're doing wonders over that there. That was AAJ. That yeah. was all AAJ working to make sure that things were fair for people that were injured. And even Texas Trial Lawyers Association, I hear a lot of complaints like that they haven't magically undone the 2003 tort reform, but if you get involved in what's happened, what's been proposed in Austin, and again, and, and not necessarily what would appear to be the most friendly environment for us, they've kept, you know, not too many bad things have happened in the last 10 years, and they were certainly proposed, uh, but by learning to work and frankly work both sides of the aisle and, and find you know, well, okay, you're in the Tea Party, you're for the Constitution, well, the Seventh, let's talk about the Seventh Amendment, the right to jury trial, and fighting common cause where they can, supporting the right people. They've done wonders. We wouldn't be in business. I mean, we, you know, I've seen... You wouldn't be in business without TTLA. I'm looking so at it. join TTLA and join AAJ. I'm looking at a case in Wisconsin right now. It's an automotive product liability case. It's a death of a minor. There's $500,000 cap. Mm -hmm. You know, can, can I do an automotive product case where if I have to go to trial it's going to be 200000 in expenses and actually do any good for the for the poor family. I mean, who cares about my fee? Let's think about if, if I'm, all I'm doing is doing a case to get myself a fee and get my expenses back, I'm not doing any good in the world. That's true. And, you know, luckily we don't have that, at least outside of the medical negligence area in Texas. And but look uh, at who tort reform hurts. It hurts the poor and those people that don't have a voice. And uh, I cannot say it enough or loud enough what great work Texas Trial Lawyers does and the American Association for Justice. So everybody who has a law practice should join. Yeah, I agree. Uh, we talked a little bit about mindfulness earlier, and I, 
and actually my the first time I heard it was when I the term was when I listened to you speak at seven in the morning for some reason uh, at an AJ conference. Talk to us a little bit about what is mindfulness. Well, I always like to start by telling lawyers and judges, mindfulness is the easiest thing I've ever had to teach and the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Mindfulness just means being here in the present moment without judging what is happening. And every great lawyer, because I think I told you earlier in this podcast, my passion is thinking about day in and day out what makes a great trial lawyer and what makes a great trial judge. And you cannot be, you cannot be a great trial judge or lawyer unless you are mindful. And in my mindfulness speech, I always have two slides, one of Mark Lanier and one of Michael Watts, and I call them the two most mindful lawyers in America. Um, Mark Lanier, his mindfulness training really comes from his training in religion and his prayer in the morning, and he's written two or three books on the Psalms. Uh, Michael Watts is uh, such an incredible lawyer and so mindful because he had to go through this criminal indictment and trial and he represented himself and he could not have done what he needed to do unless he was mindful trying his own case and being the client. Absolutely, that to take all those other voices out of your head and have to be in the moment in that courtroom had to be incredible for him. What are some things that we can do to become more mindful or to build our mindfulness muscles as you could say? It's all about training. You know, we all know, we get up, we train in the gym, and we can see our arm. Hey, our arm looks more sculpted. We've trained our arm. But I always like to ask people, what have you done your entire life to train your brain? Because the way I want lawyers to think about it is your brain, your, your mind, I'll call it your mind, is like a spoiled child. Your mind goes into loops and now you can't go to sleep because all you can think about is whether you've answered those rogs correctly. And so, in a nutshell, your mind controls you. So how do you fix that? If you can just, for three minutes a day, and I love this uh, uh, psychologist slash Buddhist monk said this, do you care enough about yourself to spend three minutes a day where you focus on your breathing and you clear your mind. Now, I will attach to that sentence, as you clear your mind, you are going to have thoughts come up. That's normal. So don't, don't say, oh, Lisa, I can't practice this mindful meditation because my mind's too active. No, you're the one that needs it. So when you have a thought, you just bring your mind back to being totally quiet, focus on your breathing, and here's, I'll, I'll end this little portion of mindfulness to say this, I'm a science girl. I, I don't think of myself as spiritual. When I gave my mindfulness speech to the federal judiciary recently, I thought this was really clever and I had so much fun doing it. I did it in the form of a Daubert hearing. Oh, wow. And what I did, I took all the recent articles on mindfulness and I talked about whether or not they passed the Daubert test. I talked about the authors, uh, whether or not looking at the journals, these were neuroscience, neurophysiology, um, and the what were they studying. And so it passed the Daubert was it reliable? What is it repeatable? The rate of error was such that it wasn't too large. It was accepted in the scientific community. So we know that mindfulness practice is, is uh, as effective in treating depression as antidepressants. And to me, that's incredible. But the one fact about mindfulness, it's my favorite fact because of my past, is that mindfulness training actually
actually increases your IQ by 23%. Wow. And growing up in the South and feeling very insecure <clears throat> about my own abilities, um, <clears throat> this mindfulness training has helped me not only to gain more self-confidence, but um, when I had a problem with my blood pressure, the doctor said, you can go on medication, and I said, no, thank you. And I actually dropped my blood pressure and my, my pulse just based on mindfulness training. I had to do mindfulness and running, but mine, I did the same thing. I don't want, you know, medications have so many side effects, and once you're on them, you're on them for life. True. Uh, but I, the biggest thing, mindfulness and trial for me has been, I think, jury selection and cross. Uh, jury selection, when you're actually listening to somebody, instead of thinking, okay, what am I going to ask them next? How, I, how am I going to get them into the, what you call the Cortez box? I mean, you listen to them. They're more likely to, because you're actually communicating. You're not thinking what I'm going to ask next, where I'm going to go. They're talking too long. Uh, I think that's been really valuable. Learning to be comfortable with silence so that when people aren't talking, you may let one of them break before you break and people start talking instead of you just continue to monopolizing it, uh, the conversation. But so many things have come out in cross-examination when I actually listen to the other witness instead of thinking about my, when I, my next question or going through my outline that I think have really broken trials open and, and turned like a medium-sized case into a big case. Because you know you, you actually you're there and you and you're listening and there's things between the words and pauses and the way facial expressions where you realize there's more there. I need to go ask this question even though it might not be a leading question and I might not really know what the answer is. But there's something there and you feel it and you go there and you find all kinds of great things. And even my last trial, I, you know, there were things that were said by my clients or by our experts that and, and I knew that the we had some weaknesses that the defense lawyer just stayed on script and didn't even get. Yeah. Uh, and I was thinking, you know, if he, had, if he was listening just a little more carefully instead of worrying about his notes, uh, he may have really hurt us. How did you train your mind <clears throat> to stay totally in the present moment? Well, I'm not all the way there. Uh, meditation is one thing I do. Uh, not Tell me about your meditation practice. I do. It's, a, it's a, based on a Zen practice, so it's sitting still... Uh, eyes open, but not looking at anything in particular. Uh, counting breaths, I try for ten to fifteen minutes. Uh, in the morning. Different times since it's when I mornings are hard for me because I have to get up. And when I'm in town, I have to get up. I have to get a thirteen-year-old up. I have to uh, get him to school on time, and and uh, and I'm more of a night person than a morning person anyway. So mine's more usually before I go to bed. Does but if I'm in, you asleep? Yes. But if I go to, if I'm in trial, I will do it in the mornings. Yeah. Uh, and in running can, can be. Can you a, imagine trying a case without doing a mindfulness exercise? Yeah, I've done uh, about a hundred of them without doing a mindfulness exercise. But you do now. I do now, and, and it's not that I couldn't win cases without a mindfulness exercise. I just think I am. I think I am at another level when I do this stuff, and and people have noticed. People on my team, uh, some judges have noticed it's it's a different experience when you are fully present in the courtroom and and open to people in the experience. And because the jury's experience it for the first time, they don't know what's coming next. And you know, trying to have that beginner's mind and going in there, and it doesn't mean you're not prepared. You have to be super prepared to do this. Uh, but and I love what you just said, Michael. You said going in there with a the beginner's mind. So I want the audience to know what you're talking about, which is you're listening with the mindset that this that you're a beginner, or this is the first time you've heard it, or like someone new to the to what's happening, which is very I think very effective. Yeah, because we forget how many years we've been working something. We know what if you're an automotive product law lawyer, you know what delta V and PDOF mean. It's, you know. It, no idea you know what a herniated disc is and what radiculopathy is if you're a car wreck lawyer most jurors have never heard those words uh right. most jurors have not been through this experience and so trying to be you know open-minded when you hear a word you don't know what does that mean and but to me the biggest thing is just when you can actually notice the facial expressions hear the pauses between the words the slight misspeak that they caught themselves on and then just Call them out on it. You create a human moment. Even if they don't admit it, you create a human moment and the jurors understand it. Right. 
So your practice now, what kind of work are you doing in the law? I just don't know how I got so lucky. I have the most wonderful law practice. I'm getting ready to move to North Carolina. Really? For the one of the biggest cases I've ever had. It's a nuisance case against the hog industry for the way they deal with their hog waste. And I'm so excited about it. I've been working on the case for two years. It deals with over 500 clients. Um, and jury selection will be everything in the case. So I'm working on that. And here's my secret. Um, I, I've been a lawyer 38 years. I'm happier now than I've ever been in my life, with, especially with my law practice. Some days with my kids, not so much. But um, with my law practice, because I only work with people that at the end of when I hang up, I could say to them, hey, I love you. I work with people that I could vacation with, that I love being with. I get so excited. There are some Houston lawyers that have cases in Dallas, and I'm so fortunate I get to be local counsel. And I'm so excited when I get to pick them up at the airport. I just, I mean, they're like, like girlfriends. I, they're just fun to talk to. So my law practice is working with people that I truly love and cases that I just, I really believe in. I'm especially happy because, you know, as you get older, you don't have to do the administrative stuff that we've all done, that we've all been trained on. And just now I do more of the stuff that I'm really passionate about, which is trying lawsuits. That's what I'm trying to get to. It's going to take me a while, but... You will get there. And I'm really proud of your practice. I know you do vehicles, uh, large vehicle cases all over the United States, and I've watched you grow, and it's really been valuable to me to see how you've done this. Well, thank you. And I noticed one of the ways you've done it is your, your training, your mindfulness, and uh, you're very insightful as a lawyer. Well, you, every day you try to learn something new and get better. That's exactly right. You try... You learn something new, try to get better, and to me, and I know this is my training, uh, growing up the way I did, but not letting things bother me. That's a gift that everybody listening to this podcast should give themselves. The older you get, the more you practice law, you should not be concerned. If people say, oh, I don't like that Michael did that, or I don't like the case he took, or I don't like what he said during a, a speech letting go of what others think is I think is one of the greatest things you can do to grow yeah it's so hard for me but uh, I've been working on it and it has been paying dividends to the extent I've been able to do it it's hard for all of us but you have to have a plan you have to have a way to do that and mindfulness has really helped me let go of what other people think yeah for me it's mindfulness therapy and running I have Good to have all you. three. Sounds like my three. Yeah. Well, before we wrap up, there's something else. You have decided to run for state bar president. Um, That's true. And uh, I am supporting you, but part of me wonders, like, we have a woman who can do anything she wants. Why do you want to be state bar president? Because of my passion. Because I want to fight for lawyers. Um, when I was president of the American Association for Justice... Um, I won't say I got fussed at, but I, I knew when I was talking to lawyers that I was supposed to be talking about victims and consumers. But in my heart, I really cared about lawyers because we're fortunate in the United States. We have a lot of groups. We have activists. We have consumer groups. We have so many people that care about those less fortunate. But in my heart of hearts, who's watching the lawyers? Who stands up for lawyers? Like in the, the state bar race, the, one of the biggest issues for me is your right, Michael, to vote. To vote up or down on dues and discipline. And the reason why that's so important is eventually if you lose your right to vote, 
eventually it can get to the stage where your fee can be capped. Um, I don't know if you remember a while back in discipline, there was a lot going on about whether or not lawyers could sleep with their clients. We as lawyers, we became lawyers, there's 102,000 lawyers in Texas with a budget of uh, 49, 50 million. And we became lawyers because we wanted to solve problems. And I love representing this, this huge group of lawyers. And I look at the group and I think, okay, I got some Democrats, I got Libertarians, I got Republicans, I got lawyers who say I'm nothing. And to figure out what do, what do they have in common that they need. And they need to keep control of what they do because the day they lose it, they're going to be very unhappy with the way their practice goes. I believe that. So I, I know there's a lot of discontent out there, uh, including by me, that the state bar is really kind of out of touch and not really looking out for us. Uh, I believe that. And, it's run like a club. Exactly. And, and I'll be honest, I was, a long time ago I was on the advertising review committee and I quit because it was a frustrating process because the people that tried to follow the rules got nitpicked to death over silly things by staff members and had to spend all this money and time whereas the people that ignored the whole process one no one was looking to see if they were doing it or not and if they got caught they were sent a letter saying pay a hundred dollars and submit your ad right. and it just seemed like we were we were harassing the people trying to do the right thing and then if anyone had any money that they could hire a lawyer and threaten us they would back off right away so basically the little guy who's trying to do the right thing right. gets harassed and then the bad guys got ignored. Right. Uh, and so I just said, I, I have better things to do with my time. Uh, There's so, and you know what? I love the state bar. There's so many great things about it, but it needs to be stopped and, and r being run like a, a, a private club. So what? I mean, it's here for all the lawyers. So, you know, hopefully you win. What are you going to do to make it better? Well, you know, one thing that I did at AAJ, which is my love, is I really want to go around and visit the smaller bar associations that don't get attention from the bar president, really talk to them and hear what their issues are. But there's one thing, I, well, there's two things. I want to make sure that lawyers keep their right to vote. Uh, I want to have open meetings open records, open elections, and open minds. Those are, that's my mantra for the, the state bar. And I want people to start, to start thinking, hey, for the first time, I feel like the state bar is relevant to me. Again, I, I mean, I talk to so many people, they say, Lisa, I don't, the, the state bar doesn't mean anything to me. It doesn't do anything for me. The problem is in Texas, the state bar has all of us in golden handcuffs. Yep. And you know things like, why is it that our CLE is so high? Please don't forget, we are a government organization. We are not a for-profit. And so one thing I think we should do is lower dues. I think we should look at CLE and think about ways to cutting the price. Not that, I mean, I. it's not going to change my life to pay X or Y. But you think about a kid who's hanging up their own shingle, and it, it makes a big difference about what CLE costs for those people. Or somebody with a public interest practice, or Absolutely. someone representing, you know, I know some of the people they're representing, they're doing family law and criminal law in an area where people, uh, 500 or $750 is a big fee. Uh, and we really do price things really high. And some of those people, they're not doing it for the money. And, and we shouldn't look down and say, oh, you're not a good lawyer because you're not making money. Well, they don't want. That's what they want. They, they see people, their heart bleeds, they want to help, and good for them. But we shouldn't make it, okay, well, then now we're going to make it where you've got to pay a large percentage of your monthly income to go to our classes or we're going to take your license away. Right. And, you know, some of the leadership, they go on junkets to New York for a week. I, because it's a government entity. I, I'm, you know, I'm chair uh, of the um, budget responsi fiscal responsibility, and so I'm so blessed I get to look at all the programs and how we're spending our money. It's the first time in the history of the state bar that somebody's done this, and there is so much fat that can be cut and should be cut. Yeah, 
And you know, you're are you the chairperson of that committee doing that right now? I am. I was appointed by the president elect Joe Longley. Great. Who I think is doing a wonderful job. Me too. I, I think that I've you know since he ran as a petition candidate and won, I really do see a movement, and I hope you're able to continue it to to really make things better. Well, if I win, I, I work hard because I I do love lawyers and I love representing lawyers. Well, I know you've, you. you've got another meeting, so I'd love to talk to you all day. But Thank bef you, Mike. before we wrap up, if someone has a case that they think, you know, this may be a Lisa Blue worthy case, you know, this is going to be, you know, we've got a mega case, we want to pick a jury, or it's in Dallas, or what, what, maybe Lisa would be interested in it. How would someone get a hold of you? Well, I'm very easy to find. My email is lblue at baron, one R, and blue.com. Um, and they can reach me that way. Um, my, they can reach me, um, probably that's the best way to reach me. I have an office here in Dallas. I have staff. And if they call, they can make sh they can be sure that I will email or call them back. Great. Well, I'd love talking to you. Hopefully we can have you, you on again sometime. Maybe talk about one of the stories, one of the great uh, verdicts you've had someday. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us in Trial Lawyer Nation. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Lisa Blue. Uh, that was incredible, to, and I just feel honored to be able to have someone like that sit there and, and talk to me and teach me a little bit more about jury selection and about all the other issues. Uh, Lisa is running for state bar president, so if you're a Texas lawyer, uh, I'm going to vote for her, and so I'm going to give her a little plug. Not that there's anything wrong with her opponent, but I'm, I'm a Lisa fan. But be sure to tune into our next episode. We're going to have attorney Matt Wright. Matt Wright's a well-known trucking lawyer out of Tennessee. He's going to talk to us about what to do in a trucking case where you have really bad injuries or a death, but the trucking company isn't that big and they don't have enough insurance. Uh, you know, cases against brokers, cases where there's another company that's pretending not to be involved, but they're really the motor carrier, and you might have a $30 million or $100 million insurance policy from a company you don't even know is involved. And Matt's going to teach us how to find those companies and how to hold them liable. Uh, I think it's something that's going to be very valuable. If you do trucking cases, I learned a lot, and I'm applying it in my firm. I hope you do too. So thanks for tuning in today. I look forward to having you with us next time on Trial Lawyer Nation. We look forward to talking with you again soon as we continue to explore powerful insights from our amazing hosts and remarkable guests here on Trial Lawyer Nation. Until then, please be sure to subscribe and review this podcast on iTunes or your favorite listening app so we can continue to reach more listeners. Visit us at www.triallawyernation.com to send us a message, listen to previous podcasts, or learn more about Michael Cowan and our guests. This podcast has been hosted by Michael Cowan and is not intended to, nor does it create the attorney-client privilege between our hosts, guests, or contributors, and any listener for any reason. Content from the podcast is not to be interpreted as legal advice. All thoughts and opinions expressed herein are only those from which they came.